Okay, so now just to kind of go through, so here's where we talked about the, the beginning chapters being kind of these um, static sections, uh, and that seemed to work out pretty well to, to do it that way. We'll see as, as revisions come along what we need to do differently. Um, then we get into the priority, what we, we were calling priority management zones. Um, in some cases, we also called them concepts, and this took a long time to try to figure out how should we do this? Um, is it by geography? Is it a certain stream or lake that's the priority? Or is it a practice? You know, in some cases we saw, well, we need buffers um, along streams throughout this whole area. So that was, that was a struggle to try to figure that out. Um, and also based on what we knew at the time, how do we determine what those priorities are? And some of it really came down to who spoke up at the local level? Who said, you know, this dream is important to us and this is why? Um, it may or may not have been the very worst place. Um, that, that's something I think we're still trying to understand. And, uh, but but that, it was really who spoke up, too. Um, and then the concept of civic engagement. We, we decided to make that its own chapter. Um, as we worked through this, we realized that it didn't really matter, well, it does matter to some extent, but not as important that we have the, um, the water quality, the technical data. If we don't understand what people are willing to do and what their capacity for making changes and taking action is, it really doesn't matter in the long run because nothing's going to happen. Um, so that was, that was a very important and awakening moment, I think, for us. And then, um, we're just having a little technical challenge on this end, but I think we're okay. Um, okay, so then we got into each of the lobe strategies. And so, again, those four lobes of the watershed. And I'm just going to show you an example of the Straight River lobe, and um, we'll see what that looks like here. Okay, so and this is the Straight River, and these are the sub-watersheds within it. Um, Owatonna is somewhere, where's Owatonna? Um, kind of in the middle, right about there, for those of you that are familiar with southeast Minnesota. So each of the each of the lobe sections kind of follows the same pattern. We did this overview of the, the landscape and land use, um, overview of the local water plan goals, and maybe pollutant reduction goals if there were any already developed for those areas. Um, list of assets, that was a list of what it kind of what did we already know about the watershed, um, some of the good things that were going on there, and, and some of the studies that have been done that could inform other things. And then what were the priority management zones for that area? And then we talked somewhat about short and long-term monitoring benchmarks that we would like to see, uh, although we've yet to um, figure out exactly how to make that happen. Um, some of what we would like here, I guess on the local level, is probably more intensive than what um, the MPCA's capacity and, and others to, to do the monitoring are. So there's that. Um, and then sort of the list of the local planning staff and local government staff. So this is just an example, again, for the Straight River watershed. We had some information. Uh, there's a USGS monitoring station there. We had ag, a Department of Ag Pesticide data, a couple of TMDLs, and other information that had been collected. So um, a good bit of information there that we could we could draw on. Here's a picture of, of some of the data being collected. We worked with Todd Kalander at the Minnesota DNR to do some channel inventory work. Um, and so this is just sort of how a, a visual of how the things came together, um, getting input from the local um, water professionals, looking at the plans, looking at um, various TMDLs and other things that had been done. Uh, buffer inventory mapping that had been done here. And so based on that, we came up with, for, for each um, lobe, I think we limited it to five priority areas because, well, one, it, we wanted actual true priorities and not just a list of 100 things. Uh, we knew that this was meant to be a short-term plan for about three to five years because our intensive watershed monitoring was still being done. Um, and so we knew that there were going to be some changes coming along. And really just to, to make it more manageable, we, we chose that as kind of an arbitrary number. So these are a couple of the 
priorities for the Straight River um, watershed. Okay, hang on just one second. Um, yeah, okay, and so within that we listed out more, a little bit more detail of, of some action strategies. We did not get down to the point of, of putting dollar amounts on projects. We didn't feel like that was going to be a good use of our time. This was just more to be a guiding document and then um, the specifics would be worked out um, as kind of things were developed. Um, and then lastly, there's a lot of appendices uh, that go along with the document. Um, the signs of progress document is there, um, the monitoring work, summaries, um, and then those list of assets summary tables. Uh, there is a list of the, the point source um, permitted dischargers within the watershed, although um, we, we don't, I don't think that any of those actually made it into the list of priorities for um, upcoming stuff. Maybe, one, yeah, a little bit with stormwater. Um, and stormwater's worked into some of these sections as well. Um, okay, so then lastly, the, there was a what did we learn piece of things. And so our report out, um, we, the, the, it, like I said earlier, the connection to the local plans really became um, important as we were working through this. And, and it's still not entirely clear how the local water plans are going to use this. Our hope is that as they're being revised, they will incorporate the applicable parts of it um, into their local plans. On the flip side, maybe we'll get to the point where we're actually doing plans on a watershed scale that are state approved plans. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, on a, personally, for me, I found it a little bit challenging to do it the way we did it because we um, we're still waiting for our intensive watershed monitoring to be completed. So we were using data that we had, but we knew other stuff was coming. So that was a little tough. Um, what, oh, sorry folks, hang on, anyhow. Um, what funding would be tied to that strategy? Um, because it's not a state approved plan, uh, that's a little bit of a challenge right now as far as what we can apply for with our state clean water funds. Um, we have been trying to work hard to tie them back to the local water plan so we can do it that way, but um, it's maybe not as clear as it could have been. The strength of the strategy is that it is for the watershed, and so that's good. It helps us to try to set some areas of priority to work in, um, and hopefully we are still pretty committed to trying to bring the groups uh, together at least once a year or so to just talk. Um, about what they're doing. The, one of the downsides is, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're, we're here um, for now and we certainly hope to be here for a long time, but there isn't really a coordinating entity um, beyond us that's making sure this happens. And, and no but one person or group is responsible for the plan. So there's a little bit of a lack of ownership to some extent. Um, and then obviously this, this document is meant to be uh, a living document, is, I guess we would say. So as our intensive watershed monitoring is completed and information is done with that, that's going to be worked in in some manner that we're still not quite sure how that's going to happen yet. Uh, we haven't done it, but we'll see what comes out. Um, our intensive watershed monitoring was done in 2011 and, and 12, and they're in the process of um, getting all that data analyzed now, and so we'll have that um, shortly here. Um, so that's what I have for for presentation. Um, Daryl, do you want to do questions, or what would you like to do? Yeah, let's uh, go ahead and open it up for questions. Uh, there is one here about uh, what is the appropriate size of the watershed that this approach uh, would work well for. Uh, you know, I think that it's uh, you have the entire Cannon River, but is it? Uh, it you know, would it still work for smaller watersheds, subwatersheds, or even larger uh, watersheds? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I think the it sort of depends on um, what you have for data, but I, th I think smaller is good um, if you can. It it allows you to get some more specificity. Like if we had just chosen 
if we had, I think, done the whole watershed and not broken it up into the lobe sections, it would have been a lot harder to prioritize. Um, Aaron, do you have you want to add anything to that? Or uh, yeah, I guess you know our plan is really based on probably 250. Uh, thousand acres because we really broke it up into four um, and I, I think in a way it gets easier the smaller you get because you can come up with more specific strategies like Beth said you get less general more specific which I think is easier to implement Um, and I just pulled up our website page. Um, we're going to be in the or are in the process of doing a few um, cosmetic updates here shortly. But for, as Elise says, right now this is listed under our projects page. Um, and so if you want to go and like actually open chapters and look at things, you can do that uh, to get a better sense of what's in there. All right, yeah, and if anybody wants to ask a question, you can uh, raise your hand, and then I'll unmute you, and you can ask the question, or just go ahead and type it into the chat dialog, and I'll read it out, and we'll get that answered. And maybe another question is, what are some of the appropriate, or I guess what are the, the next steps, or where do you see this particular uh, plan going, strategy going next, and and do you see uh, any others coming uh, down the road that uh, may try to do the same approach? Um, well, we will be, like I said, once we get our intensive watershed monitoring data um, over the next year or so, I think we'll be looking at the, the MPCA will then be doing um, their watershed TMDL, and I'm not totally clear on, on the process that that's going to take yet, but that will then inform some of the, the priority areas. So we'll be making some revisions probably within about three years. Um, between now and then, you know, we, as we're looking at what projects we can take on or, or help our uh, local partners to try to get going, we keep looking back to this document and seeing, okay, what did we say were priorities? Where do we want to work? Um, so we're definitely using it as a, a decision tool and prioritization tool. We did submit some Clean Water Fund uh, grant applications that were based on some information that was in here. Um, it doesn't look like they got funded, but that's okay. <laughs> we'll keep trying. Well, it, uh, maybe a thought, another question, too, is you talked about the uh, being able to go down and have the conversations at the local level, which really inform those priorities. And can you talk more about the why you use that to, to identify the priorities versus just going purely upon the scientific data that's available? And uh, and how that actually you know, is important for determining what should be a priority. Yeah. Well, some of our areas have, have more data than others, and I think you know, we wanted to, the people that are actually out in the, in the various sections of the watershed you know, have a better idea of what's really going on there day to day. Um, the limited amount of monitoring data we have, I don't think necessarily tells the full story. And we needed their buy-in and their support, um, you know, even if they didn't necessarily care so much about the whole watershed plan, their section of it is important to them. And so it shouldn't just be, uh, you know, if I'm writing about something going on in Waterville, which is 40 miles away from me and, um, you know, just from my office, it doesn't, it doesn't make it as a legitimate, I think, of a plan. So we really needed to have their buy-in. Um, to be part of it. All right. Any other questions from any other folks? Go ahead and uh, click to raise your hand or type in a question. Um, maybe in the meantime, Beth, do you have any other thoughts or follow-up uh, uh, question uh, statements before we go here? 
Um, yeah, I think I would just say I, I think it was an important process to do it. We learned a lot going through it, and you know, like, especially I think with the civic engagement piece. And it was one of those situations where when we realized what we wanted to do, it was kind of late in the game. And if I could do it differently, I would have done a lot more probably on the civic engagement and at the beginning. Um, I was I liked that it, it forced us to do some prioritization and tried to help encourage the, the locals to do that. And I think it highlighted that there's still a long we, there's still a lot that we need in terms of just um, technical skills and abilities. Um, it varies across our watershed as far as who's able to um, you know use some of the lidar data and GIS data and what we can do uh, on that end of it. Do you want to add anything else, Aaron? <laughs> it's been a year and a half, so we're a little rusty on what did we do? 